We are building up a large network of organizations that follow the ultimate goal of providing a better access to research data, in particular along, uh, according to the FAIR principles. And as of today, it is my great pleasure to welcome two speakers from the consortium PUNCH, or PUNCH for NFDI. Their title is Towards Exabyte Scale Data Management in PUNCH Sciences. And as you guess from the title, it's about large, very large, if not to say huge volumes of data and how to do data management uh, with these topics. It's Christoph Wissing and Matthias Höft. But before introducing the both, I will shortly introduce the topic. The, the talk will cover various topics from the scientific disciplines represented in PUNCH, and that's basically physics. It will discuss the corresponding infrastructures that are underlying uh, the consortium and in particular outline the, uh, outline the data volumes generated with these infrastructures. And not all of the NFDI consortia have the same amounts of data. So it's very interesting to see how very large volumes can be handled. Many of these experiments or observatories generate enormously large amount of data in, in physics and astrophysics. And accordingly, the community in Punch has addressed these research questions for quite some time now. And it's very nice that you share your experiences as of today in our infra talk. Christoph Wissing is a staff scientist for particle physics at DESI. He studied physics in Dortmund, did a PhD in particle physics at the well-known HI experiment, uh, which I think was conducted at the Positron Prot Proton Collider HERA, if I'm uh, informed correctly. Uh, he participated in European grid projects, in particular EG and EGI, and he had various responsibilities in the computing management of the CMS experiment at CERN, of course, and in the WLCG, the Worldwide Large Hadron Collider Computing Grid. In Punch, he's the co-chair of the task area data management. Matthias Höft sorry, is the head of the Extragalactic and Astronomy Group at the Thüringer Landessternwarte in Tautenburg. He studied physics also in Darmstadt, but also in, at the TU Berlin. He's the chair of the German Long Wavelength Consortium, which coordinates the German participation in the low frequency array, the so-called LOFAR quite well known. And he's the, actually the PI of the LOFAR two meter sky survey. He is an expert for data processing at the Forschungszentrum Jülich. And last but not least, he's a member of the Square Kilometer Array Science Working Group Cosmic Magnetism. And as well in Punch, he's the co-chair of the task area data management. Christoph and Matthias, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. The floor is yours for your talk. Thank you. Yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, it's our pleasure to be here uh, and that we have the possibility uh, to introduce um, our view, our angles on, on data management in particular in our sciences. So as far as, as I um, know, as I'm concerned, I think it's the first um, punch for NFDI talk in, in the series. So therefore, we would like to take the opportunity and also introduce a bit punch sciences. So it's in our title. So let me start and share the screen just a second share i hope you can see my slides yes all fine uh, Sorry, but it's not the first slide. one yeah exactly not the title but okay share. excuse me for that so now to work Okay, here we go. Okay, that should work now. Yes, it looks good. And you might want to, yes, okay. enable me for yeah. taking that over if needed. So sorry for some organization aspect. So I think we, we are not so much used in having two speakers in one talk. Uh, so we have to, um, to learn the data management of these uh, presentation data. Okay, um, so, so what I would like to, what we would like to do uh, in the beginning is to very briefly introduce with punch sciences. So what is punch sciences? So who are, who are the guys you are dealing uh, with here and, and what is our scientific background and what are, the, what are our scientific interests and what are the data we are working with? So that will be the first part of our talk, of our presentation. 
And then gradually uh, we come to the data uh, we work with, how we handle these data, what are the challenges uh, which come with the data, and what needs to be done that we can achieve our scientific goals. So we, we have questions and we want to answer these questions. Um, and uh, in this process, we generate data and this uh, data needs to be handled. So that is, so therefore maybe it's a bit special in this talk so that we just took the liberty or that we want to introduce our scientific background a bit. So PUNCH, PUNCH for NFDI. So that is a consortium uh, which started uh, last October and PUNCH stands for particles. So that uh, reflects particles and uh, theoretical physics or so just called uh, lattice QCD here and uh, astroparticle uh, physics. The universe, that is astronomy and cosmology um, and nuclei and hadrons, yeah, everything what, um, what you may know about nuclear physics. So we want to understand how how these nuclei work. So in, in the background, uh, there are large groups um, well organized in Germany. Uh, for instance, the uh, particle physics um, is a scientific community which is represented by the committee uh, for elementarteilchen physics. So that is um, what we call uh, one of the uh, punch scientific uh, communities. So in the image you see, and that is something what we will talk about later, um, a typical experiment, what is done, yeah, such an accelerator experiment. The second um, group, uh, scientific group behind it is a committee for astroparticle physics, CAT, uh, which detects uh, neutrinos uh, which come from um, explosion of, um, of massive stars uh, in the universe. Um, and so what I um, belong to, but is uh, what rep represents my scientific discipline is Rat Deutsche Sternwarten, so uh, all institutes uh, which uh, research astronomy and um, cosmology and uh, we do these observations uh, of the universe. And finally, uh, nuclear and hadrons um, is rep represented uh, by the Committee of Hadron and Kern Physics. So these four scientific communities together um, have formed the punch for NFDI uh, consortium. And we represent, uh, we, um, we work in the interest uh, of the scientists uh, in these communities. So as I introduced earlier, so we, today we took the liberty to also briefly introduce our scientific question before we come to the rather technical aspects. So for instance, for instance so we want to know uh, how does black holes form in the universe? You may have heard about um, the first image of the black hole and we will briefly address it uh, in the talk. But well, we want to know uh, what forms the dark matter in the universe. Later, so as astronomers, uh, we are convinced um, that there's dark matter in the universe, but we do not know what it is. Um, we want to know what happens when very massive uh, stars explode. Uh, so these are then uh, this is um, this provides very extreme conditions for particles and nuclei, and uh, so we want to understand uh, what in these objects. Um, what governs these objects, what are the physical laws uh, in these situations? So these are the scientific questions um, we have. And so one possible uh, topic which unites our discipline is uh, that we investigate matter in extreme environments. So here in this diagram, you see how the universe evolved from early times so in seconds. Uh, so then the universe expands. Um, Later on, galaxies form, and uh, these are where we are here today. So, where we are in the, new, in the universe, black holes are represented over here. Some photons are behind us. And so, that is the evolution of the universe. And if we go back to the beginning, uh, but where really the initial conditions of the universe are, are set, so we do read energy densities, particle energies, which can be tackled nowadays uh, by. The experiments. So we want to understand what happens early in the universe. We need these large um, experiments to get an understanding uh, of the physics and of the composition of the universe at the time. So in many aspects, when we look um, into this evolution of the universe and what fills the universe nowadays, we look at, at matter in very extreme environments, very extreme conditions, which are very difficult 
to reproduce um, in Earth over here. And then we go to these extreme conditions. So we can study the fundamental physics laws. Uh, so we are convinced that in our environment, these, uh, these laws are well proven and can be used. But how do these laws extend uh, to these extreme conditions? And that can be probed from various directions. So as astronomers, we observe the universe, but as particle physics, physicists, um, experiments are done. As introduced earlier, the one of the, of the one of the main goals or one of these topics which really drives currently a lot of, of research is what is known as dark matter. So if we look at what we have in the universe, so then only five percent um, of the energy of the of the content in the in the universe is understood by us. So these are the atoms, the baryonic matter. So that is something where we know what particles form these atoms. And when we look at the rest, um, what we know, what is in the universe, that we do have dark matter, where we have no clue uh, what it is nowadays, and we have dark energy, but it's even more en um, enigmatic. So as astronomers, we observe, for instance, a galaxy uh, like the C33 over here. And from the kinematics of the stars, we know there's matter in the galaxy which is not luminous. That is why we call it dark matter. So from these observations, we do know that it does exist. But when we go to our understanding um, of the composition of the universe, we do not know uh, which particles do form it. So therefore, experiments are needed to study this. And so for instance, um, such a large, um, Collider experiment is used uh, to study that. I think, Christoph, so that is more in your direction now that you can tell a bit more about these experiments. Yes, so as Matthias said in the beginning, we want to address really extreme conditions and therefore we need very high energies or have to observe particles at the highest energies. And that requires really huge facilities. And here are picked a few examples like the flagship programs uh, of the involved communities here. And in the, on the left here, there is a, a oops, that shouldn't have happened. All right. Um, uh, that is uh, um, LHC at CERN. It has uh, four big experiments and they are really big experiments in each experiment. There are more than a thousand uh, scientists involved. Also, very big um, is the FAIR facility that is being built in, in, in Darmstadt that is uh, focusing uh, on, on, on hadrons that is still under construction, as you see here in this uh, image. And data taking is still planned in the later 2020s. The flagship um, project of the astroparticle physics is a, a CTA observatory. It also has uh, roughly 1,400 members using uh, this Cherenkov telescopes. And radio astronomy, also a huge experiment, is a, a Meerkat uh, experiment that is in, located in South Africa, which is a pathfinder for an even greater uh, square kilometer array. But we also have uh, huge computing infrastructures, uh, the supercomputers, primarily for uh, theoretical uh, physics calculations, but also for um, cosmology. But there's of course a lot more in our communities um, like satellite experiments, we picked here, uh, the Gaia one, but also smaller accelerator installations like the Esdalinak one uh, also located in Darmstadt and uh, many, many more examples uh, that we do not really list here explicitly. And well, but all these uh, produce uh, large infrastructures, uh, generate data and quite a lot of them. And we now go into a few more examples that we of course picked uh, according to our scientific expertise. And uh, let me first uh, talk a little bit here about um, particle physics detectors. There's a sketch here on, on the left. And uh, here from the, from the sides, they are entering the particles and then they are smashed here in the center. Of, of the detectors, they are really huge. They are big, like like a, a family, a two family house or something, and and then you observe the trajectories uh, 
of the particles that are being produced in the collisions. And there being a lot of these uh, collisions uh, produced, every 25 nanoseconds, you have a, a crossing of, of, the, of the particles at the LHC. So you take 40 million pictures of these particle collisions every second. And then this uh, detector, you have to imagine maybe like a huge uh, uh, a digital camera, which has more than 100 million readout channels, many of them uh, analog. And if you would read it out really with the frequency of the bunch crossing, you would end up with uh, one petabyte per second of data, which is of course completely unfeasible to store. So you have to select the interesting events. You have a few microseconds time to buffer these and make your decision. And in the end, you store about, hundred, uh, about 1,000 events per second uh, to permanent storage. And one of these pictures of a collision is about one megabyte large. So you have a, a logging rate of about a gigabyte per second, which you can handle nowadays. But you have to process these. And the large infrastructure that the CERN experiments are using for that is uh, Worldwide LHC computing grid, the WLCG. In the background, you see a, a Google Earth uh, a shot, which actually has a small um, a plugin where you, in almost real time, uh, can see the data flows and the participating sites of this uh, structure. And it's actually quite some sites distributed worldwide. It's more than uh, 170 sites, and uh, and they form the basis what we have as compute and storage resources for the um, LHC experiments. One should note that uh, the same structure is uh, being used by closed communities, for example, also other uh, particle physics experiments, but also astroparticle physics and also Lattice QCD community, just to give a few examples. Um, so the sites interoperate as a, a huge federation of storage and compute uh, by means of some agreed uh, interfaces that are this sort of traditional grid technology. So you have uh, compute elements that are some, somehow a front end to a, a classical local batch system. You might now uh, talk or Slurm or HD Condor. And the storage element uh, have also agreed uh, WAN access protocols nowadays, usually WebDAV or uh, grid FTP. And the whole thing is in operation since almost uh, 20 years, of course, with growing capacity over time. But that brings uh, also a lot of legacy concerning technology. For instance, we have uh, still um, the X509 certificate technology for our AI. We are in, in the move towards a more modern token-based authentication. But experience shows that this uh, technology migrations took rather years than months. And then I want to show you a, a very few uh, uh, numbers here. You see on the uh, top right, here, this is just a, a random pick here. At, at, at that time, there were more than 300,000 jobs running in the infrastructure and more than uh, 800,000 CPU cores uh, uh, utilized. And the throughput is typically also shown in this plot there. It's uh, 20, 30 gigabytes per second, which is uh, the WAN transfer. So that it's a transfer between the sites. Matthias. A similar yeah, thing, we, astronomy. Back to astronomy, um, I think here's exactly the, a bit, to some extent, the opposite uh, from what you, what you just showed, um, namely the first image of the black hole. Um, so here we do see the, um, the first image uh, displayed over here. Again, um, it's hard to imagine uh, so what effort uh, went into the generation of that image. So eight telescopes uh, distributed over the world uh, have observed. And they are distributed in, in South and North America and Europe, um, and that's the South Pole and Hawaii. Uh, and so these, they're so separated um, and the transfer rate would have been so high uh, so that it was not possible to connect these telescopes online. So instead, for this first image, 20 petabyte of data were taken within one week uh, on disk. And then so the data transfer, not like uh, Christoph just pre presented, um, was done uh, via airplane. And then these data uh, were brought to processing, processing site. So different sites were chosen. Uh, so 
Um, they all had the necessary software, the uh, small variations um, to generate um, then the image out of um, what then have been released. I think it is almost uh, it's incredible so that 20 petabyte of data are needed uh, to generate the image. So that is really necessary and that is one of the highest resolution uh, that's been ever achieved. So if you translate the resolution here so of the telescope, so then you could observe and I think the usual comparison is that you could, could see an apple um, on the moon so that is necessary and therefore one goes to these very large distances. Um, at very high observing frequency, so the highest what can be done uh, with these radio telescopes. The processing um, uh, is called here, so that is what we call offline processing, so that after taking the data with the instruments, everything um, happens not in real time, but can be stored um, and then processed one or twice uh, or so on. In contrast to that, uh, is, um, as was introduced earlier, so I'm involved in the, in the European LOFA telescope. And here, instead of the Z uh, telescope, we have many stations distributed over Europe, the largest distance, maybe from Ireland uh, to um, southeast of Poland, uh, that's about uh, 2,000 kilometer distance. And in total, uh, there are 50 stations um, that are. Um, distributed um, across various countries and operated uh, by all these institutions. So many institutions are involved over here that makes it interesting, but occasionally also a bit uh, more complicated. Um, so that is where we are located in, uh, in Tautenburg, um, our um, observatory over here. And here you see um, the antenna fields. Yeah, very simple antenna. And that, that is a basic thing over here. We do have very simple antennas that record the cosmic signals. Um, about 100,000 of these um, very simple antennas does exist. Uh, they together form these uh, phased array, so that, um, how we call it. So one of these stations just represents uh, just a typical parabolic dish. And, and that is a key point over here. We transfer this data with a rate of four gigabit per second to a central processing. And now all this processing um, happens online. Yeah, so in real time, so when data are taken, it will be immediately processed um, and um, centrally recorded um, and then put into a long -term archive. We'll come to that um, in a second. Maybe um, an even more extreme version is so when we look at the square kilometer array, which is under construction. So it has two sides. So one side is in Australia. Uh, and the other side is um, in South Africa. And um, so the South African side will have uh, almost 200 dishes and uh, the uh, Australian side will have uh, an enormous number of, uh, of antennas similar to, well, okay, slightly different design, but also simple antennas uh, uh, comparing to what we just showed. And these antennas uh, generate data. So if you just look at the, Right at the antenna, so it will, we are talking about a setabyte uh, per year of raw data rate, but that will be combined um, in central data processors, uh, which have which have to deal with terabytes per second. Um, uh, so that is online processing, uh, and then it goes to the offline processing, the science data processor, and in the end, um, about seven hundred petabyte per year. Um, will be stored um, in the are expected to be stored in the long term archive. So if you talk about taking data for 10 years, uh, so then uh, so the expected data volume is uh, seven exabytes. I think Christoph, you deal with similar uh, data rates and data volumes. Yes, in particle physics, we expect uh, similar, sorry about that, similar amount of uh, data in the, in the coming years. So the um, LHC uh, collider is being upgraded to the so-called high luminosity LHC um, towards the end of this uh, decade. And that means that we will observe or record more of even more complex uh, events. And uh, one can do a quite detailed modeling what resources we expect uh, to see. And this is shown here in this uh, in these graphs. Um, there we see uh, 
what we use in uh, disk space today. This is uh, something with 200 uh, petabytes. And then we have uh, given by experiences how this will, will grow just by, let's say, by technology that we buy uh, the same or for the same money, we can buy more um, storage. And then it depends how optimistic the scenario is that, that is here with, uh, with the dashed lines. And then we do some, some modeling, uh, how much disk space we would, we would need. And then here, this is a run three. This is just a, has just started with the, with the LHC. Then there will be another shutdown. And then in 27, there will be the upgraded LHC. And then you really see uh, that the demands are, are rising. Uh, but we, we hope here really uh, to be able to manage this within a somewhat uh, realistic expectation how the technology will grow. And uh, a similar plot is here also shown uh, for the tape archive for the permanent storage. And this is becoming uh, quite challenging because that is not so easy to be reduced. Uh, uh, really the raw data that comes off, out of the detector, this is something you, you wanna preserve. Uh, and this is hard to reduce. And there we really still have to do some uh, research and some thinking uh, how to cope with the challenges uh, that are coming in the, in the near future. But in any case, we will uh, reach by the end uh, of, the, of the 20s, really um, the exabyte scales uh, for, for a single experiment um, to deal with. So how do we do this in a, in a bit more detail? Um, we give here two examples. And let me start with this uh, rather busy slide, uh, which shows the data flow uh, of the CMS experiment. That is the one which I really know best. And the values are for the last uh, data taking here of the so-called run two. And uh, so here on the left, you see we, we have the real data as I showed you uh, in, in, in this image here. Um, and if we record this, uh, we have an event size of about one megabyte per second. But in, in that year, we uh, took almost uh, 50 a billion events. And that gives us uh, the need to store almost 50 petabytes of data. Actually, we store it twice because the raw data are so precious. All the data um, usually um, at the same amount, we generate also a Monte Carlo events. Nowadays, uh, people like to call this a digital twin. In particle physics, all this is uh, very well established since, since decades. It takes about one core minute per event to simulate this. And the reconstruction of such a shot in the CMS experiment takes about half a core minute uh, per event. And uh, that you do for all the events and, uh, and, and then you get your reconstructed events and you usually organize this in uh, various data tiers. And they are getting smaller in size because you uh, can condense them and you store only the most important uh, uh, properties. And you can really reduce by orders of magnitude um, the, the size uh, per event. And these you store then uh, also um, on, on disk for, with, with um, varying um, um, replication factors. You also do uh, a reprocessing because by time you know better what data you have collected and you can recalibrate this and reprocess this. The software is improving and, and then you run this, this chain again. And uh, all this data that you produce, and if you sum up these numbers, this is close to 100 petabyte of data for one year, but you also have to uh, have the previous years on disk and at that time, uh, as I was talking about in 2018, we had roughly 150 petabyte of, of disk in the WLCG. You have to uh, dynamically uh, manage all this because you cannot store everything on disk all the time. But a certain amount of these data have to be on disk for the distributed uh, analysis. And uh, yeah, I should have mentioned that all that is done by a, a comparably small team, uh, very centrally managed according to uh, plans that are worked out within the experiment. But then the distributed analysis to a good extent still is done on the WLCG resources, but becomes organized maybe in smaller subgroups and teams or up to individual scientists. And, uh, and to give you some ballpark numbers, uh, such an analysis typically needs a, a few terabyte on, on disk, maybe a bit more, a bit less, but there are several hundred uh, analysis in the experiment ongoing all the, all the time. And as I said, there's uh, 
uh, stored partially within in the grid, but also locally on uh, university clusters or, or even individual workstations. And yeah, in a typical analysis uh, takes two to three PhD brain years. And in the end, we hopefully get, uh, get out some papers. And this is about uh, two papers per week by the collaboration that gives you roughly uh, 100 papers per week. So in the end, the science that we have is just uh, 100 megabytes, um, which still takes uh, several uh, brain months uh, to finalize the paper. And when I prepared this, I discussed this a little bit with Matthias. And interestingly, for the LOFA telescope, uh, you can compare the numbers uh, quite a bit. So Matthias, how looks your plot? Yeah, simpler. So in the first place, so I don't have, let's say, detailed numbers on which experiments um, or what we, we store for these um, different events. But, but the basic thing, so we start from a very simple recording, as in your detector, to in the end, we want to have some papers uh, which are produced by a PhD and uh, but also by, um, by, by staff scientists um, occasionally. Um, is the same and um, a bit similar to uh, as already shown with uh, uh, this is data reduction um, we saw for uh, for the image of the black hole that 20 petabytes are needed uh, to create one image in the end so um, that is a bit um, situation over here that we start with this antenna rate uh, so if i estimate so each antenna um, is digitized and uh, we have the information what uh, every antenna records. We start with, uh, with 40 um, terabit per second. So that is, uh, that is a signal what we get from all antennas doing observation um, in the LOFA array. But clearly um, that would be, a, that is a data rate uh, which is too big to be transferred or to be handled. So we, we have to reduce this data. So what we do is beam forming. So we look into some direction on the sky the Lofa could observe uh, the entire sky at the same time, but just for um, for for for, for um, the, the transfer and uh, can compute resource reasons, we cannot do that. So we have to restrict um, what we observe uh, to a small portion on the sky and have to work with that. That is beam forming, and we also lose information. So there are groups in Lofa which would be very much interested in having these. In, um, the antenna information, so the cosmic gray, um, the cosmic gray um, key science project, uh, they, they do exactly that. They look at the antennas and take the signal of each antenna and look back in time for a couple of seconds. And then they, they know what kind of cosmic gray has just hit the earth. And they went even further, they, they investigate um, lightning. So what, is, what how does how does the lightning propagate in the sky? What are the electric fields? In, in, and thunderstorms that we all done with these antenna information, but we cannot keep that. We have to produce information on a station, and then we go to online processing. Um, what I just introduced before that centrally um, in growing information um, of, of all stations in Europe um, is uh, processed uh, to data products, uh, which then go into. Um, a long-term archive where they can be stored. So that is in the, the data rate, um, 500 um, megabit per second, uh, so roughly uh, a couple of terabyte uh, per day are stored uh, in the long-term archive. So these are the raw data product, but maybe a bit special for astronomy. Astronomy has a, has a very long tradition, tradition in open data. So there's some embargo time, okay, so whoever has applied for that observation and has with has got that access, um, can use um, these data exclusively for a certain time, so typically a year. But after one year, so these data are public. So these enormous amount of data uh, is available uh, for, for everybody, for every scientist uh, that can be used. And you can imagine that uh, just um, making those data public um, is already a significant uh, challenge. So then we do have uh, the offline processing, okay, that is not finally calibrated and uh, so we, uh, the interferometer, so we, we don't have images. Uh, so what we do is and if we process the data to create sky maps. You know, we, want to see, we want to see, we want to see nice radio galaxies on the sky. Um, so that is what we want uh, to produce. 
um, and then that is combined with other information. So I think a very important aspect is this multi analysis. So what does other telescopes see? And maybe what is the time evolution at the same time? And so that then leads um, or, or gives the input uh, for scientists uh, to do the work, to do the individual analysis, uh, study this object, uh, study sample of objects, identify the sources, classify the sources, uh, which gives uh, these results in the end. So just so a side note, uh, so the LOFA a two meter sky survey takes observes another uh, hemisphere. So that will produce uh, then a map uh, with 120 billion pixels. Uh, and, and just the map um, with some frequency information and so occupies already petabytes uh, of data storage. But again, so we have these very extreme data reduction from, from taking these data to um, the final publication. So I think we, we have introduced and we have motivated here um, so that we have facilities uh, which generate an uh, enormous uh, amount of data. That this data has to be handled uh, to uh, achieve our scientific goals. And uh, so in the next few minutes, we would like to, uh, to introduce um, two examples for, for tools, um, what is needed uh, or what we use uh, to manage uh, these data volumes. Yes, so and I take this over here to talk a little bit about Ruscio, which is uh, in particle physics and a very important uh, tool to manage data. But let me first uh, recap what is uh, the main data flows um, that we have to do there. So the real data is, of course, created at the site uh, of where the experiment is located, but typically can be processed or analyzed anywhere in any participating uh, site or even institution. But the Monte Carlo simulation data, uh, that uh, can be created also at, at any site, but then potentially has to be made available for analysis or again for reprocessing at uh, any other site. And then, as I said, usually you cannot store everything uh, permanently uh, uh, on disk. So you have to have your transitions uh, or you have to archive the things first to tape and stage it back if, uh, when it's needed. So one tool that uh, addresses this is the uh, Ushio data management tool that was originally developed by the Atlas collaboration, which is also one of the four big experiments uh, at CERN. It was de designed really with a decade of experiences uh, with previous data management tools. And uh, let's say the key objective uh, is really that it uh, provides a, a global namespace to store all the data and uh, provides uh, declarative rules for the management. And then it interconnects all the participating storage facilities that can be uh, globally distributed. Meanwhile, this, uh, uh, tool has um, formed into a community effort that actually goes even beyond particle physics. And I'm giving here a few examples. Um, naturally, here in acceler accelerator-based uh, particle physics, it's of course the Atlas experiment uh, who has invented it. Um, but two years back, uh, also the CMS experiment has adopted it. But it's also used uh, by Bell 2, which is an experiment in, in Japan. Compass is another experiment uh, at CERN, with a smaller one. But also uh, the neutrino physics community um, has adopted this. Uh, Dune is uh, accelerator-based, actually. It's to be built at, at Fermilab in the US. And then the Ice Cube is a neutrino telescope, which we showed in the beginning. But also gravitational wave obs observatories, uh, the famous ones, the LIGO and Virgo, that discovered those um, uh, are using that tool. It's uh, also planned to be used within astroparticle physics in CTA. And also in astronomy, uh, people are seriously uh, looking into that uh, tool to use it in the LSST or in the already mentioned uh, SKA. And then we have yet another thing about computing, the tool which Matthias will talk about. Yeah, um, so what is um, I think what we motivated is that for the data analysis, we need um, at various aspects um, 
computing um, and computing resources. So for instance, to, uh, to compare um, well, this Monte Carlo simulations um, to, um, or to um, in our radio astronomy um, environment, we do source identification, uh, we do, um, we, we try to cross correlate um, with, um, with other resources. So that all requires for, for the end user uh, to have access to computing resources. And there are large computing resources. Um, and I think for the community, it is very uh, beneficial if these computing resources are used efficiently. And I think so this is one effort, um, again, from the high energy uh, physics community to make that happen. And so the tool, the resource manager uh, is a Cobaltadis, uh, which allows to combine, also in this uh, case, of, um, several computing resources located um, at the kit in Casco and Bonn uh, um, in Munich, to combine these compute resources um, for the, the end user, so the, 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 the user doesn't have to decide directly uh, where the job goes. And then when computing, um, when the job is submitted, when computing is done, so the system um, can decide uh, so what is the appropriate uh, site to carry out the job. So that clearly comes with boundary conditions so what job sizes are, um, are most appropriate for the system and what can be done. There are other conditions. So the job can be run on the resources or so does every, uh, uh, every uh, compute site uh, that they're open um, for these different jobs. So that all needs to be uh, implemented and handled and that works uh, very successful over here. So it is an integration on demand integration where these resources are in principle available and when necessary, they are used uh, on the different sites, uh, these resource um, manager um, needs, uh, needs to be set up and then Cobalt Artists will uh, just manage that. And on top of it, uh, uh, there's an overlay batch system, so here um, HD Condor, uh, which just makes a um, job scheduling and uh, distribution. And here's an example, um, so how these different sites uh, in the uh, combine to uh, total computing facility, uh, which uh, uses up to 17,000 cores uh, at the same time. So that brings us back to where we started, uh, to punch for an FDI. And I think the example, what we showed beforehand, um, that is a very good motivation and um, illustration for an aspect what we want to realize and punch for an FDI. And in that community, uh, we do have um, large available infrastructures. So we don't mean here, so the observatories, uh, rather storage and compute infrastructures. And if we, uh, if we will be able to federate uh, storage and compute resources with the available tools, and that is what Christopher and I just tried uh, to show before, there are already tools available which um, allow us to do many things and they need to be combined. Um, and uh, if something is missing, so that is what we have to develop. Uh, and, uh, we have to fill the gaps. So we want to use these infrastructures. We want to federate these infrastructures so that the community um, can make use of these um, resources. So as shown in, in this previous example, so the, the, main, um, the main achievement is the available resources um, can be used much more efficiently. If I look at um, said our LOFA um, data archive, uh, so I think a typical example, what we have is that uh, so if somebody comes with a, with a better data uh, analysis and says, okay, now I want to reprocess all the data since I know I can calibrate the data better. So then we need for a short time, uh, a very large uh, resources in computing and uh, maybe also in temporary storage. So we would not um, install that for that uh, time, but it would be extremely helpful uh, if resources could be made available uh, for that. And I think the community um, would actually benefit 
uh, from federating storage uh, available federate uh, federate available storage and compute resources and to integrate more opportunistic resources which are uh, then maybe only used uh, um, on demand so we are from this task area data management uh, so we consider that as kind of a as a possibility to enable a science data platform so I think for all what comes in the future, uh, we do expect that users um, would benefit enormously if they could not only get the data. That is something what we have in astronomy already. We often know that you, the data are made available, um, but you want to, but you also need to process your data. So it's not only necessary to get access to the data. It's also necessary that you get access to the necessary computing resources which then allow you to run a certain analysis. For instance, what is the most likely uh, dark matter particle? So what we do in the task area two, so that is kind of the groundwork, that is a, a machine room for such a science data uh, platform, which is a, um, one of the aims of PUNCH for NFDI. So that brings us to the end, Christoph. Do you think we have uh, addressed already everything? Well, for sure, we have not addressed everything, but I think we have consumed our time slot more or less. So let me uh, summarize with a very few um, highlight items. So I hope we could show you that uh, the modern experiments that, that we are involved generate enormous amount of data. And currently we have achieved already a level of 100 petabyte per experiment, but the next generation will truly bring us uh, towards uh, the exabyte level. And uh, the analysis of, of this data and the processing that really requires a federation uh, of all the available storage and, and compute resources. Within the community, particularly the astronomers have a long tradition also in, in opening their data, but that also is becoming more and more um, common in particle physics. So there, uh, we want to learn from each other, of course. And the community has a long experience in developing and then operating the appropriate software tools, but also setting up uh, the complex infrastructures. And within the consortium, we really want to try to, to bundle the, the strengths of the um, involved punch uh, sub-communities uh, where everybody brings in different experiences and we hope to sort of bundle this uh, to enable uh, better science here uh, within this sub-community. But let me close really with an upcoming thing, do a little bit advertisement. So that was the first contribution from uh, punch for nfdi members here to this infra talk. But there will be soon on uh, May 11th, there will be a tool talk by two of our close uh, colleagues, uh, by uh, Harry Enke and Kilian Schwarz, and they want to um, uh, introduce our experiences uh, with, with uh, um, AI infrastructure. And that should be it. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Christoph, and thank you, Matthias. My real applause goes to you. Thank you for giving uh, such a nice overview and also providing some in-depth insights into what you are doing in Punch. And actually it's a quite impressive infrastructure as you all know, of course. The room is open for questions, but before we 